Part four of A Lyriel or A Voyage to Other Worlds, a tale by Vladislav Lachsima. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Giant Worlds. Chapter twenty one Demos and the Voyage from Mars through Space. Higher and higher did we rise from the ice mountain. At our feet the green expanse of the Delarue Ocean opened wider and wider, with the verdant billows rolling one after another in long lines, like the huge pampa grass of your American plains, with now and then a white snow cloud resting on expanse. Higher and higher we rose, till the red cliffs of Schroeter's land were in sight, and the white and red plains of Tycho's Island, now dappled by snow, with the Lockyer Sea in its centre, and then the wide ruddy plains of the Copernicus, Galileo, and Huygens continents. Still higher and higher, till, from a sea of green, the world we had left seemed, as it does to you, of red and white, the ruddy plains and forests glowing like fires beneath the blazing sun. It looked very rich and gorgeous in its varied colours, a splendid and majestic spectacle, none the less so because every point we could see had now for us some pleasing reminiscence of what we had beheld when viewing it more nearly. Higher still we went, till Mars seemed as a huge globe beneath our feet. Our first start was, as I said, for the moon of Deimos, one of the two little satellites of Mars. It is one of the smallest of the worlds of the solar system, for few even of the planetoids are so minute. Its surface is smaller than that of the Isle of Wight. London might have almost covered one of its hemispheres, and Paris would have taken up a great part of it. It was a half-moon when we approached it, and its aspect, part black as night, part shining in the sunlight, was very striking. At first it seemed as a huge balloon rolling through space, but as we drew nearer, the rocks and cliffs showed it a tiny world, hardly deserving the name of world, were it not for its regular orbit and its position in space as definite a satellite as comparatively huge Titan or your moon. The aspect of Deimos is very striking. Its size is so small that you feel that it is a globe even when upon it. Indeed, it appears little more than a colossal meteor, an expanse of rock and rugged canyons of piled cliffs and stones. We rested on one of its largest rocks, and thence surveyed the dreary little world around us, and the great ruddy planet with its green seas and its snow-clad hills and polar ice and glaciers. It was a lovely sight. Mars is so glorious in colour, one of the loveliest, the most varied, the most gorgeous of the many worlds that roll around the mighty sun. In other worlds, one colour is prevailing. On the earth, blue and green. In our lovely Venus, white, and the paler, or more glowing, tints. But in Mars, all colours save blue, the very antithesis to the earth, where blue is dominant. Mars has the dominant hue of red, and the earth of blue. Glorious he looked from that tiny moon, and from its rugged cliffs and rocks, and as we rolled on around him like a moving panorama he opened to us new splendour seas continents oceans and mountain chains ruddy plains and green lakes all dappled by the white fleecy clouds and in some places glittering with snows all appeared before us as we moved with more than railway speed around this world it was like a ballooned view of earth only on a far vaster scale the motions of Phobos, the other satellite, varied the scene, as he also dashed through space around the gorgeous and many-coloured orb, the sovereign world to both. It was a wonderful and splendid scene of glowing hues, and in the evening, when the stars decked the skies, the city's lights made it appear hardly less glorious than by day. We lingered several days on that tiny moon, rolling round the ruddy planet, thus watching the oceans and continents opening to our vision. There was a fascination in the scene so that we could hardly tear ourselves from it. It was like rolling in a car through space, 
a car so small and rapid that one felt and perceived its motion which one cannot do in larger satellites as we spent our time watching mars we also compared notes i told my companions of my travels and pointed to them the cities and long lines of roads of mars and they in their turn showed me the natural treasures they had collected the plants the rocks the smaller animals they explained the variations of nature they had observed the operation of the natural laws the combinations of the elements they pointed out to me the lakes and rivers the mountains and morasses of mars and told me of the measures they had taken and the wonders they had seen in the many ruddy lands that we saw rolling before us then at length azariel wearied of our long delay and our rapt dwelling upon mars said let us behold more perchance mars is not to be compared with the mightier orbs beyond let us go on forward into space to behold new splendours new miracles of divine love and power we assented to the justice of what he said and tore ourselves unwillingly from the ruddy orb and its tiny satellite and went onwards into space we put our machine into action the compensating force was set against gravitation the little moon and the orb of mars lost their attractive power and we launched into infinity far into the black ether studded with its myriads of distant systems the huge measureless ocean of the infinite the satellite diomos rushed away from us in his course around mars and we plunged in our little ether car into infinity our first work as before was to seek for one of the meteoric streams rolling away from the sun we soon flying through ether came on one of these a long crowd of rocks poised in space rolling on through ether around the sun in an ellipse we attached our car to one of the larger of these and then swept on with it the journey was long and would have been somewhat tedious had we not had abundant occupation in arranging the wonders we had collected in the ruddy world we had left behind the rock or meteor on which we rested offered but little to employ us it was but a few scores of yards across and was formed irregularly it was a mass of iron and manganese chromium and sodium still it was easier than the ether boat we had attached to it sometimes we landed on it sometimes remained in the ether car we analyzed its rocks and examined microscopically their texture and found in them vestiges of infusorial life of many orders on on we went on towards the vast system of worlds to which we aimed on day by day speaking of the earth or venusian days up to a year ever forward we flew with the long flow of myriads of meteors around us dimly reflecting the sunlight and jupiter slowly growing larger and brighter till we felt that we might get within his influence then azariel called us into the ether boat and he detached it from our friendly little rock and we launched out again into space but now purposely the anti-gravitating power was not used we were within the influence of the planet and his vast mass we rushed through space as fast as a cannonball fired from a rifle cannon hundreds of miles a minute on towards the great world before us end of chapter twenty one part four of Illyrial, or a voyage to other worlds a tale by vladislav lasima this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty two first impressions we went with terrific rapidity to that huge globe which constantly grew huger with his four moons rather planets than moons rolling round him the orb of jupiter was evidently wrapped in clouds long lines and belts and broken spaces here and there through the masses of mist in which we hoped to see the planet himself at length we felt we were getting into his cloud land the force of gravitation had then to be compensated 
if we said aronial strike land like this we shall pierce into the depths like a bullet for many yards back with the pressure undo the gravitating power we did so still the momentum was terrific swift into the clouds we dashed long miles of floating vapour were passed through in a few moments it seemed as a dream a mere gauze veil then a momentary glance at a vast expanse of heaving tempestuous ocean overcast with overhanging piles of clouds then a tremendous splash and we were rushing into the waters of the ocean of the great planet to any man it would have been instant death but we have as you know far mightier vitality than man's and under the waters we can live for a long time still the crash was inconvenient to us and when the resistance of the waters had quieted our onward motion Ezariel again put the force of impetus to the ether boat upward and we rushed up again out of the ocean's depths to the planet's surface the boat glowing with heat caused by friction and the waters hissing in a cloud around us we rose therefore in a vast whirlpool with great clouds of steam rising from the heated depths until again we came to the surface it was a vast ocean in which we found ourselves the waves rose to the height of real mountains and sank again we floated on this tempestuous sea such as the earth in its worst hurricane has never seen hoping sometimes as we were swept upwards on a mountain-like crest to catch a sight of land but none could we see having thus floated for some time aroniel proposed that we should rise into the air and by flying over the surface seek for land we flew up to a moderate height under the clouds the wind was not so violent as the waves would imply and even they were going down now so we managed to fly in the air floating beneath the clouds over the tempestuous waves our ether car floated rapidly like a balloon over the great heaving mountains of the mighty waters like a mountainous region but all in motion peaks and cliffs of foam ever rising and falling long we floated over many thousands of miles but nothing save liquid mountains hundreds of feet high and dark ocean valleys were in sight no land nor trace of land did we see at length aroniel called out from the top that he saw an island it appeared really to be one but very small just like a large rock on the sea a few hundred yards across we descended and landed on the island it was not firm in a moment we felt its heaving as it was shaken by the waves it was evidently of some light substance floating upon the waves still putting our ether ship into a cleft we rested a while watching the strange scene of the tempestuous waves and the vast overhanging clouds and every moment were reminded of the primeval chaos such as our world and the earth were in in the remote ages before the time when lands and continents were defined and when all was yet unformed surely said aroniel this huge planet has not yet attained its solid state like earth and mars and our world after some hours of wondering at this scene we were inclined to explore our floating islet one of the first things we noticed was an enormous cavern of a hundred feet high in the rock we entered it and passed into a huge hall the extent of which partly explained the floating power of the island for it was practically as hollow as an ironclad and if the walls were heavier than water the hall made it lighter and gave it buoyancy the hall was colossal in proportions much larger than any cathedral i have seen on earth on one side of it was a large terrace and the surface was damp though the waters in mass were well kept out of it the roof was vaulted huge arches were raised of the massive rock and the dripping waters had formed vast stalactites there was a certain grandeur and beauty however in this rocky cavern 
as we examined it by the electric light which azariel took with him at the end were two great openings which might possibly lead to more huge caverns in the rock as we were admiring the cavern suddenly a strange gigantic being entered the open door he was of colossal height rational and erect in aspect yet strangely fish-like also a vast monster of the deep yet apparently something more than a mere brute his body was covered with scales his head was not altogether stupid and he had a forehead and walked erect like a man i can best describe him as like what one of the huge beings of the secondary formation of earth of the oolite or lias would have been if endowed with intelligence and reason yet he was more symmetrical in aspect and therefore more beautiful than they ever were he evidently was of the type of life which in the earth is still seen in the huge monsters of the deep and yet he looked in aspect semi-human like to the fabled titans of the old greek poets a monarch of the deep colossal and majestic yet for all that oceanic he entered the cavern dripping with water and at once seated himself on the terrace he rested back as if weary and leaning on the rock he sank off to sleep this gave us a chance of examining him we mounted the terrace and contemplated his huge limbs at our pleasure he was evidently formed to live in the water rather to swim than to walk and certainly not to fly the pressure of gravitation of the huge planet made us feel that swimming was the most suitable mode of existence there to walk was an effort for one wanted a resisting medium and this huge body was formed for the purpose of floating in the waters or for plunging into its depths as we thus surveyed him with our electric lamp which on his entry we had extinguished another gigantic being entered the cave and resting on another terrace also sank to sleep the cavern darkened we went to the opening night the short night of jupiter was setting in the sky was covered with stars and three of the four moons were shining on the heaving waters it was a wondrous scene that ocean and its heaving waves and the starry sky with those three moons shining in it on we went over the heaving ocean surface on for hundreds of miles now and then however floating islands did appear heaving on the oceanic waves some of them appeared not to be natural but artificial the work of created intelligences on some of these as we were floating in the air we could see the colossal jovians resting on them these islands were not like the ships of earth merely for floating on the surface but sometimes they sank suddenly into the deep and as suddenly appeared on the surface i noticed the difference to his aerial men float on the surface because they want air to breathe if they could live under the surface they would doubtless sink into the deep and construct ships to do so like these huge ships which seem to us floating islands of the jovians we resolved also to explore the depths of the vast ocean author's footnote there are three classes of views about jupiter one that which is held by mr proctor that it is an unformed world and therefore as yet unfitted for life two that of swedenborg that the inhabitants of the greatest of the planets are of superior nature this cannot be refuted as thereby they would be superior to the destructive agencies at work on the planet three monsieur flammarion's view that life is here manifested under strange forms in beings both vegetable and animal of astonishing vitality in the midst of the convulsions and storms of a developing world is the one i would favour it is hard to believe this huge world a lifeless desert though terrestrial life such as we have on earth could not exist there end of chapter twenty two
Part four of Illyrial, or A Voyage to Other Worlds, a tale by Vladislav Lachsimer. Chapter 23. The Ocean World. Down into the deep we sank, on rushing through miles of water, as we passed onwards, thousands of strange monsters of the deep met our sight, swimming about here and there, single and in shoals. Most of them appeared as irrational as the great fishes of earth. Some were reptilian in aspect, more like the ichthyosaurus or the cetiosaurus of the secondary formation of earth than any earthly fish. Some were apparently higher in type, like the oceans or dolphins of the earth's oceans but a few appeared of rational nature and were provided with singular implements of swimming alone or elsewhere floating in submarine ships of metal curiously designed and propelled through the waters with great velocity footnote they are aqueous gelatinous creatures too sluggish almost to be deemed alive floating in their ice-cold waters of saturn and jupiter shrouded for ever by their humid skies plurality of worlds three o one at length we came to a strange scene of such aquatic vitality such as i never dreamt of and such as i can scarcely describe it seemed like an island in the waters it was manifestly not the solid bottom like the bottom of the earth's ocean huge walls and towers appeared vast and massive as one might expect in the hugest world of all our solar system amidst them swam hundreds of vast forms dashing hither and thither in the waters it was a scene of bustle and motion and activity and yet all most strange nothing we've yet seen is like this said azariel neither in mars nor in our own home nor yet the earth or her satellite i said this is a world of waters all other peoples we have seen live on the surface these dwell evidently in the depths of their huge world to them the waters are as the air to us and might we not have expected this replied azariel have we not known for ages that this giant world was very light in its gravitating power considering its size it appears a liquid sphere or system rather as the mighty sun is a vast orb of gases or metals fused into a gaseous state in our world as on earth and mars all three states of matter exist fairly proportioned the solid the liquid and the gaseous in the earth's moon you say you only found the solid in the sun there seems to be only the gaseous why should we not here expect to find the liquid dominant a world in which fluid prevails as with us the solid now we can understand the sudden changes we have seen even in a single night upon this vast globe his shifting belts his spots forming and dissolving in a few hours and some wondrous example save the mighty sun himself of vast and rapid change in our system now we can understand his lightness his comparatively small gravitating power perhaps even his brilliancy there must be an advantage in this said Aroniel, to these huge beings some of whom seem endowed with intelligence they are not bound to the surface as men or the martians are or near the surface as we they can traverse their world up and down down into its inner depths for hundreds of miles on earth i replied they partially feel this advantage of the waters it is true man has never yet obtained that sovereignty over the sea that he has over the land but still the sea is of use to man it is the great highway of commerce upon the sea he carries much of his products the dominion of the sea confers on the nation that holds it a supremacy and power that other nations have not the sea is a great civilizer for the ports of many of the wilder regions of the earth are far more civilized than the interior regions and the last strongholds of barbarism and savagery will probably be the inland parts of africa from the sea man gathers much of his food one of the greater problems of his future on earth perhaps is the utilization of the ocean to his purpose on earth there are as it were two worlds of life the terrestrial and marine 
and of these the marine is the larger though the less important each world has its animal and vegetable kingdom with their orders families and general species as distinct as though they belonged to different planets then it seems said azariel that earth must be a sort of means between this world and the solid moon in mars we have seen a world where land is quite dominant though sea exists may there not be a law in this the larger worlds more fluid the smallest solid the medium ones mixed our conversation had an abrupt termination one of the huge jovians at length perceived our ether car and rapidly swimming to it strove to grasp it seeing the danger of our capture and not knowing how we might fare with these huge beings for once we felt helpless and overcome but we had provided for such a possible danger in our car we had as i said vast command of electrical forces seeing the peril i at once set the electricity in full force as he grasped our car the shock rolled him back into the waters then we set the full motive power at work up we dashed through the deep for a moment it seemed as if the jovians would pursue us for several noticed our ether car but we rushed on defying pursuit towards the surface rapidly we dashed upwards through the waste of dark waters till at last the great billows of the surface could be felt heaving to and fro and then we rushed up into the air through masses of hissing foam we rose from the surface into the mistlands beneath the clouds it is well said azariel we have escaped those jovian giants of the deep but it is sad to think that we cannot hope to know them as we did the martians their nature is too distinct from ours for us to understand them or to make them understand us and yet this huge world of waters like everything in creation appears wonderfully suited for its object how different each world is from all the others said Aroniel and yet each doubtless in its way most admirably adapted our fair world is very different from that gorgeous world of mars and from your account earth and the dead world of the moon are very different from each and now this giant world is utterly different from all the others not utterly i said there is an underlying unity beneath all this diversity End of chapter 23part four of illyrial or a voyage to other worlds a tale by vladislav lachsima this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty four the land of fire when we came to the surface we again resolved to rise into the air we rose over the mighty heaving ocean of the giant planet there is no chance said Aroniel, of conversing with these huge beings as we did on the gorgeous planet we have left whatever may be their polity and their thoughts their faith their hopes we cannot know they seem of another order to us another class of beings the inner and lesser planets such as the earth or our own planet of love and the one we have left all have much alike and so life in them is like but here we have life of another type and one with which we cannot well communicate not quite another type i said on earth as i told you they have this type but in a low and soulless state in the fishes of the ocean in the earlier ages of the earth it was more developed than now men now place these fish in aquaria and watch their movements the scene we have just beheld somewhat reminds me of the monsters of earth's ocean of the type of life in their seas here it is still more gigantic still more marvellous and it would seem that in these huge frames intelligences are enshrined it may be for what we know of a nobler order that crystal city was grand and wonderful design and beauty was there but of strange kind it is not for us to judge these singular vast beings whom we cannot understand it looks like the fish type exaggerated and developed said azariel 
but is there not some truth in the old beliefs of mankind on the earth which are now exploded of titans and mermaids and ocean beings endowed with life and intelligence on earth there are none such and never were but it may be that man by inspiration or by instinct or by contact with spirits superior to himself has gained the thought of such a type of life as this endowed with intelligence on earth once it was the hugest type of life and still it is so for the animals of the sea are greater than on the land what is this light to which we are coming said azariel i see a vast fire raging over the sea then we looked from our windows and saw far over the heaving waves a long line of blazing fire as of huge masses burning perhaps this world said oroniel is still unformed as you saw in the moon a dead world worn out exhausted where life is destroyed and finished with here may be an imperfect world a huge mass yet developing which has not thoroughly cooled perhaps so i replied as upon the earth it would seem when the cooling process had gone on for many ages the sea was first inhabited by living beings before the land was properly formed one thing has struck me he said ever since i came here the much greater heat of this world than we expected men as you say supposed that this giant planet would be too cold for an abode of life because it is so far from the sun and yet now the air is far hotter than it is even in our sunny world and even the tropics of earth are not so hot as this but the heat here is plainly internal not solar it is from jupiter himself and not from the sun there is one origin of the heat plainly said azariel pointing to the blazing copperous looking fires the heat is like the blast of a furnace i said it reminds me of hecla on earth in a state of eruption but no earth volcano for many thousands of years has ever blazed like this the air would even now be insupportably hot for any terrestrial animal men would call this the heat of boiling water and still we are miles off had we not better turn away from this eruption the instruments will soon be affected by the heat and some of our collections destroyed azariel consented and we upraised the ether car a mile or two the better to contemplate the terrific conflagration there were rising out of the waters surrounded by huge piles of scoriae and ashes some hundreds of miles of blazing flames and incandescent matter out from the deep rushed vast columns of smoke and steam and ashes whilst glowing rivers of lava flowed towards the hissing seas which in a cloud of mist and steam from time to time enveloped the volcanoes stromboli vesuvius etna hecla indeed all the volcanoes of either hemisphere of earth together in full eruption would not produce such an effect as this End of chapter 24, end of part 4. Part 5 of A Lyrial or A Voyage to Other Worlds, a tale by Vladislav Lachsima. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Chapter 25 Saturn Titan Author's footnote. Reference. Look then abroad through nature to the range of planets, suns, and adamantine spheres, wheeling unshaken through the void immense. We ascended from the wondrous scene of the fireland, and vast hissing mists, and the huge waving sea of the giant planet. We pierced the regions of cloud around him, and at length we came to the vast black expanse of ether studded by a million stars. Again we launched into the infinite. Thus once more we plunged into space, infinite space, dark, airless ether, with the myriads of glittering stars far off on every side again we got upon a meteor ring and swept on through space toward the mighty system of the ringed world 
the journey was long days and weeks and months by your earth measurement of time passed on this weary voyage still saturn seemed little more than a great star in space with its mighty rings and its eight moons slowly growing more and more distinct on still on we swept away from the great orb of day the sun which slowly grew less and less glorious as we travelled onwards we compared our experiences of the worlds we had seen and examined the relics of them we had collected the conclusion we came to was that which i had anticipated the solar system is one yet it is unity in diversity the elements of matter are the same the metals the rocks the main forms are one as springing from the same great nebula of primeval chaos but the combinations differ even in the giant world we had left there was nothing really and essentially new to us except in form and combination the origin was the same the main points of being identical but an infinite variety in combination so also with life we had seen no really new forms of life even on your earth they are to be traced though often imperfect and low in development as the worlds were the same or very nearly the same in metallic elements in spherical shape in motion in atmospheres in gravitation in electricity so also is the vitality on their surfaces titan and mimas at length we came within the influence of the great ringed world and felt ourselves dashing towards it by the huge power of gravitation like three huge rainbows in the starry sky appeared the mighty rings vast tracts of nebulous matter cast off by the planet in its rapid whir such rings as these aronial said were probably once around all the exterior planets around jupiter where the four moons sometimes still remind us of them around little mars even when deimos and phobos were in formation around the earth when the moon was being cast off into space in paleozoic times all once were ringed worlds but they have passed that stage of being yet here we have a very ancient world still by its own inherent power retaining the ring formation a last relic of a primeval stage of world existence as we rushed forward we felt the force of attraction drawing us from our onward course we were deflecting towards one of the minor worlds that rolled around that great ringed system it was the chief of them the satellite you call titan the greatest of the satellites of our solar system greater than the world mercury himself on on we flew on to this lesser world worthy of being a follower of the great sun but now a satellite of saturn let us rest on one of the mountains said aroniel and watch this wonderful system a miniature of our own great solar system with yon huge world as a minor sun around which these eight worlds roll and the three rings around his surface marking that which once circled on a smaller scale the earth and mars we flew on towards this moon not very much less than the earth itself continents and oceans were stretching far and wide beneath its clouds it was a strange world primitive in formation imperfect in development i cannot well describe the wonders we there saw the marvels of its heavens were great and the wonders of its surface greater still it was as it were a world of double suns the one the glorious sun now shining with rays feebler far than those which you know in the arctic regions of the earth the other the great ringed sun of saturn far larger and more majestic with his triple walls of light girding him like a huge citadel enclosed in triple lines of fortifications and there also were to be seen the seven sister satellites that followed like seven great planets while beyond there were the planets we were wont to see in the heavens 
and our own world and earth now fading in the distance yet all were indistinct compared with the great system of saturn around us we quitted this giant satellite before titan had made a quarter revolution around his primary the great belted and ringed world and plunged into the system itself passing by four of the moons rhea dion tethys and enceladus until we came to the little world of mimas where we rested again i cannot describe the strange things of that world of mimas earthly words depict only earthly things or at best only things of nature akin to those of earth but here there were other forms of development other conditions of life and other resultants than such as you find on earth and yet just as the minerals of that world were much the same as we have and as you have though in quite strange combinations so the elements of life were somewhat the same though in the dull imperfect light less developed in their higher forms one thing was singular however which i had not noticed yet the higher living creatures of that world neither walked as the animals of the dominant type of life on earth or mars nor flew as we do in the dense atmosphere of our glorious mountain world nor were chained to the depths as the huge beings of the great planet but sprang i asked aronio why should this be it is the effect of gravitation do not you feel how light you are you see on this world there are two forces at work the moderate gravitation of mimas and the less but still felt power of saturn one gravitation partly neutralizes the other so by slight exertion these beings leap they neither need to walk nor fly a slight effort overcomes their gravitation here practically all things belong to two worlds the little satellite on which they dwell and the mighty planet like a giant globe many times the size of the sun in our skies above them the evenings in that little world were wonderfully glorious there ever through the sky were rolling the huge orb and his three rings and the seven sister moons ever varying in their phases there was nothing here it seemed to detain us save wonder there was nothing beautiful nor sublime in this world only things quaint and strange however the heavens above and the changes there were wonderful so we rested on a mountain far removed from the lower manifestations of life which filled the plains those weird beings that seemed with little effort to rise from the surface and go where they would i can hardly describe our final journey into the realm of saturn the voyage from mimas to the huge central orb itself nothing had we beheld more magnificent or awe-inspiring than those giant rings there was a solemn sense at the approach to the outer ring we drew near to it purposely but as we approached nearer its solid appearance dissolved rents here and there appeared in its surface and what looked solid at a distance was manifestly composed of millions of fragments of matter meteors in millions were sweeping onwards in many streams if there be anything on earth to which i might liken it it would be the lake of a thousand islands only the islands were not rocks rising out of the waters but shining meteors in space and the medium in which they floated was ether not water as swarms of bees the millions of meteors rolled on in space around the huge belted orb of saturn end of chapter twenty five Part five of A Lyrial or A Voyage to Other Worlds A Tale by Vladislav Lachsimmer. This Librivox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty six Saturn Here nature first begins her farthest verge and chaos to retire, as from her utmost works a broken foe with tumult less and with less hostile din 
Milton's Paradise Lost. On, on we went, through space, towards that vast belted globe, the great rings rising overhead like a huge aurora, and the moons in a vast corona around. It grew huger and huger, till its glistening clouds formed a vast expanse before us, and the belts of Saturn grew into huge openings. Into one of these we dashed. The scene of that outer region of mist was not unlike that of the great planet we had left, Jupiter. It seemed as if we were ever going on and on for hundreds of miles, with the huge seas of mist rising around us. At length we came to a resistance, as of some solid expanse of matter, through which we dashed, and then felt our further progress stopped in a great morass in which our vessels sank. We had some difficulty in extricating it by using all the force we had in the stored electric force of the machine. When we reached the surface again, it was indeed a strange scene that met our eyes. A huge forest, as it seemed of gigantic plants, was there in rank luxuriance. They looked akin to the lower orders of Earth's vegetation, something like giant lichens. In nature, or rather in position in creation, not remote from the forms of vegetation that formed your coal shales, all were of low type but of colossal size, such as would suit a world in process of formation, such as existed on your world in the Carboniferous Age, such as our world and possibly Mars once knew when in their earlier stages of development. Strange it is, I said, here in these giant planets we have worlds that seem in the state of formation which we know our world and earth once passed through and yet in some of the satellites for instance in the earth's moon we find finished worn-out dead worlds how can this be as it seems this world of saturn is a more ancient world than ours thrown off long ago by the sun perhaps it is simply said Aronial, because this world and Jupiter are so huge that they have more independent existence, more difficulty in developing, so as to suit the higher types of life. Here we evidently have a very early type of world. Not only has it eight satellites, but you see it even retains the ring which Earth and Jupiter once had, but which ages ago they lost. All here is antique and archaic as indeed men foresaw in their theories of astrology. Here one may study the Juventus Mundi, an antique, primitive, undeveloped, half-chaotic world. He had scarcely finished when beneath the huge shadow of the giant fungi appeared a strange and terrible creature, inchoate like all around, huge in size and ill-formed in aspect, something of the insect type but colossal, it moved towards us. For once we felt horror. I had, alas, felt it on earth before, in scenes of woe and crime. But here we felt there was a creature of huge strength, yet of nature not akin to ours. Whether he had intelligence I cannot say. He moved among the gigantic fungi to our ether car, and then moved it with his huge ciliated limbs. His aspect was horrible. After staying and looking at it with seeming curiosity, though it may be no more than a mere animal might feel at a thing strange and unknown, he let it go, and then passed on into the huge forest of colossal fungi and lichens. This was not the only denizen of the forest. Strange forms still appeared, such as men never think of save in nightmares, some gigantic, some of more moderate dimensions, but none apparently of any nobleness of aspect, nothing like what we had seen in other worlds, and all seemed of inferior types, or rather developments in great size of the inferior types of life. We remained in our car, watching these strange beings pass and repass. This seems, I said, like some of the dreams of Dante's Inferno. These horrid inchoate forms are what men dreamt of in the Middle Ages as the eternal companions of the spirits of the wicked. Is this a region given up to sin? 
a world more fallen than earth even a realm in rebellion against god not necessarily so said azariel it may be only a region undeveloped as yet where nature is imperfect where as yet she cannot produce her masterpieces it may be that the higher forms of being may even thus be developed in these strange types it would seem i said as if there was some little ground in the notion of the old astrologers of earth that this vast planet is inimical in its influence saturnine is used even now among men as a term for dark harsh evil influences it may have been that it was because this planet removed from the sun's rays is less brilliant than the others or it may have been that man by some higher instinct or revelation knew that it was of a form of creation distinct from earth in one sense it is and saturn is more than another world than ours or earth it is another system his rings and his moons mark a complete system distinct from the others though chained to the distant sun by the power of gravitation may it not be that solar influences so potent with us and still energetic in the earth and mars here are weak and that the planet himself has a force an independent existence distinct from the sun we felt this in jupiter here it is more manifest had we not better secure ourselves first and afterwards discuss these points i see another of these strange saturnine monsters approaching us as he spoke we turned and saw another huge being of extraordinary aspect rising from the morass and making towards us we loosened the anti-gravitating force and rose into the clouds here poised in mid-air in the saturnian atmosphere we watched the wondrous scene night was coming on the sun small and cold-looking was sinking in the clouds it was a very different sort of day to yours or ours the only thing i can liken it to was the short dark day of a north russian winter but it was not cold from the planet itself there rose a heated steam evidently the result of its internal fires a world yet not half cooled such as yours was in the carboniferous age of the coal shales as night closed in the scene grew more than ever grand seven of the eight moons were in sight titan was at his full japetus was half moon mimas enceladus rhea were in the first quarter dione and tethys were at the third this alone this galaxy of splendid moons would have made a wondrous spectacle but there was something still more marvellous like a huge yellow comet only such a comet was never seen by man from the eastern horizon to the western stood the huge arc of the rings it might be also likened to a rainbow but more firm and solid in aspect and not of many colours the chasm between the rings came out clearly and between them the stars could be seen we floated on in this wondrous spectacle over the vast world the glorious rings and the seven moons giving light for seven only were in sight to the strange scene of heaving oceans and here and there low islands clad in mist and cloud of that strange world night soon passed again the sun rose to give a clear light to that singular spectacle but still a dim one compared to that which you and we have soon after sunrise however the great banks of cloud hid him from our eyes and we were enwrapped in mist we resolved to rise out of this using our anti-gravitating power we rose once more into clear space and then beneath our feet for hundreds of miles we saw the vast clouds rolling around the mist-clad planet such as on an overcast day the aeronaut sees the earth clad in cloud we flew on hundreds nay thousands of miles but still nothing but cloud was visible and the strange forms that moved through his forests were all lost to view it was a huge cloudland end of part five end of chapter twenty six
Part 5, Chapter 27 of A Lyriel, or A Voyage to Other Worlds, a tale by Vladislav Lakazuma. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 27 Return Let us go back, said Azariel. We have left a world of love and beauty to behold one of terror and wonder, where all seems unsympathetic to our nature. We have no place here. Happiness calls us home. We have seen enough. Aroniel was at first inclined to make a still further plunge into space to the great world of Uranus, but I agreed with Azariel that we had evidently passed beyond the regions where our nature was in place and that it would be well to go no further. We had seen enough of the wondrous works of God to satiate our desire of knowledge. Let us go back, I said. We have seen enough. We have no place here. So once more we mounted in our ether car and plunged into space, and looked for many long days in wonderment still on that marvellous system of worlds and rings that we had left behind and never wished to revisit. By degrees it sank into the sky and grew amalgamated into one planet. By degrees the great sun regained his glory. We had long passed the orbit of Jupiter when suddenly we perceived the force of gravitation drawing us toward a strange-shaped planet, or world rather, which suddenly appeared before us. It is one of the planetoids, said Aroniel. They are not all spheres like the other planets. They are probably fragments of some great ancient world destroyed in primeval time, or else broken pieces of a huge ring that once circled our sun, like the rings we've just seen around Saturn. We drew near to it. I cannot well describe it. More desolate than your moon, more terrible in its desolation. Vast mountains, waterless, treeless, huge masses of rock, coagulated blocks of star-forming matter, nothing living or moving. We rested on it some days and wandered on its strange cliffs and then plunged off again into the orbit of the gorgeous planet Mars. Shall we not visit the Earth, said Aroniel? You have seen it, but we have not. Perhaps we may find on it some things which you have not seen. If you so resolve, I said, you must indeed beware that men do not find out who you are. I kept my secret well, and only to one man did I quite reveal it, just before I left it for our home. If you do not keep your secrets, and if men find out who you are, you may lead them into sin. Some will be ready almost to worship you, some will mock and deride you, some will brand you as impostors. In the end, they will quarrel over you, and then you will lead them into sin, and thereby yourselves will fall and offend God. Then let us land in some place where men are not, and yet where we can see some of their works afar, say of some mountains in a fertile and cultured region. I can only think of the Alps, I said, as a place suited for us, from them you will see a part of France and Italy and much of Germany. Men will not trouble you and you will not trouble them, for you need not go near their cities nor their haunts. If they find you amidst the snows and glaciers, you can flee from them and hide yourselves in the great fastnesses that man has yet never trodden. If we go from Alp to Alp, we may see a great deal and have a fair idea of earth. But I warn you, go not into the haunts of men. One might do it and be unknown, as I have been. We could not all do so. Good, said Aroniel, let it be so. We will land upon the earth, but avoid men. We will see the works of man from the mountains and afar, and gather what we want of the natural wonders of the earth in spots untrodden by man. So be it, as you say, let us make for the white spot on the little continent, for so you call the Alps, as ever snow-clad. We directed our ether car towards the earth. Again I saw the familiar lines of the continents and oceans expanding before me. Again I saw the lights of earth's cities. 
we directed our course to the tall white cliffs of the jungfrau at length we reached them and once more i stood upon the rocks of earth amid the ice and snow and rock of europe's greatest mountains my first thought was to send to you this narrative of my journey may it encourage you to lead the higher life on earth that in another state of being you may be found worthy to know the glories of the heavens if you wish to see me again come to jungfrau to the place marked on the twenty sixth at sunset Illyrial. at the bottom of the page i noticed a map of jungfrau with a place marked by a cross i looked at the page i rubbed my eyes is it true or a dream end of chapter twenty seven end of part five Part six of A Lyriel or A Voyage to Other Worlds A Tale by Vladislav Laxemer. This Librivox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty eight Consideration I should like to go, I exclaimed. Oh don't exclaimed Maud. It is a long journey to Switzerland, and she paused i do not like these supernatural beings if they really are such i do not like anything above this earth perhaps it is a mere imposture if so you should show yourself a mere fool to go if it is not you will be utterly in their power do not go i believe it is all nonsense after all don't go her arguments were convincing i thought over it no i would give it up it might be as she urged a mere trick of a designing man or a dream of some maniac next morning when the subject had been slept over and i had been just working out some practical scheme of business maud looking up from her work said if you're going to switzerland i wish you would take me with you but my dear i've given up all thoughts of going it is an imposture probably or a delusion of a very eccentric man i should like to ferret it out she replied i wonder what it all means do these statements suit what astronomers have really found out about the planets as far as i know they do but for all that i think it is a mere delusion of some person who perhaps has learnt something about science if there is anything in it surely it would be worth seeing someone from another world even if one went to switzerland to see him well my dear but what is the good of it the probabilities are against it and besides that you were opposed to my going last night so i was but give me the privilege of my sex i am full of curiosity about these curious things i wonder what they are like to make a long story short i yielded i made arrangements for going away our things were packed and in a week from the receipt of the mysterious packet we were en route for switzerland we crossed via new haven to france and then from dieppe went to paris there stopping a day to rest we proceeded via dijon and dole to neufchatel and thence to berne end of chapter twenty eight part six of a lyriel or a voyage to other worlds a tale by vladislav Laxima this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty nine jungfrau we got to n on the slopes of jungfrau about noon on the twenty sixth we lunched at a little auberge and then climbed up the slope pretending that we were merely on a walk and refusing a guide without much difficulty we reached the spot pointed out by illyrial on the map after some three hours walking we sat down on a rock waiting the sunset slowly the orb of day sank to the west amid the glorious mountains the rosy tints of sunset were just beginning to adorn the peaks when i noticed coming towards me a figure wrapped in a large cloak who as he drew nearer i saw must be my mysterious friend oh i am so frightened said maud seizing my arm there he is i wish he had not come 
i wish i had never persuaded you to take this mad journey do not fear dearest all will be well god is overhead and will protect us besides there is nothing evil or unkind in this strange being i am glad you have come said posela for it was he my friends would like to see you before they leave earth they wish to see a man before they quit this world and thank you madam also for coming they will be glad to meet you he added to maud you are as welcome as your husband follow me it was easier said than done the ascent grew more and more difficult and in some parts rather dangerous Illyriel had to help us in several places but he said nothing and i was really i must own it too awed to trouble him with questions the scenery was magnificent but terrible the sun had now set and the alpine pinks were tinted with rose light this grew dimmer and dimmer till the cold white snows stood out against the black night sky still we followed our mysterious guide up the mountainside at length getting anxious i said is it much further it is dangerous to be on jungfrau in the dark and it soon will be dark we have almost arrived descend this gully he pointed to a small depression in the mountainside almost full of snow we following his direction glided down into it some thirty feet then he led us a few yards up the ravine to a vast snow pile and pointed to an opening cut in the snow taking maud by the hand he led her towards it she entered with him and i followed close a metal door stood in the snow Illyriel opened it a blaze of light came from within maud who was in front and thus could see more than i gave a sudden scream and fell backwards fainting in my arms what could it be as yet i had seen nothing but the light Illyriel took from his breast a phial and poured a few drops on her lips she revived almost at once crying out oh do not go in they are dreadful so unearthly who i said let me see i leant forward and once at least in my life i beheld a scene plainly of another world it was a small room encrusted all over with crystals of every colour and strange ornaments in curious designs it rose into a little dome-shaped roof in the centre of which blazed a powerful electric light which made all around glitter on the walls were fixed a dozen or so curious instruments of a nature quite unknown to me in the dome there fluttered a large eagle which had evidently been alarmed at maud's cry but this was not the curious part of the scene on the side of the room opposite to the door were two strange beings with large wings but who i noticed in a moment after were somewhat human in aspect with faces full of intelligence and of calm expression on their breasts were brilliant gorgets of jewels of diverse colours and down to their feet hung long robes of metallic tissue richly embroidered in singular designs it was indeed a combination of the bird type of life with human or more than human intelligence they looked at us as if with curiosity and interest and then each waving their hands for they had hands unlike the avian tribe over their heads in what looked like a gesture of greeting suddenly burst forth together in a short song of welcome soft sweet and enthralling it had a most weird and unearthly effect they seemed utter foreigners to us in every sense in nature in language in mode of greeting in fact they evidently were not of the earth this is our mode of greeting a stranger said Illyriel. every nation on earth has its diversity of customs surely another world must be distinct from earth in all things i bowed to the mysterious beings and entered the jewelled room maud stood at the threshold still awestruck but i beckoned her to come in also it was truly an unearthly scene 
I never realised till now how perfectly and cleverly Illyriel had disguised himself to seem so human. I looked around me. All was quaint and unearthly, but for all that beautiful. Crystals of every tint glittered around and about me in curious and quaint designs. Everything looked different to what we are accustomed to see. It was impossible to conjecture what some things were for and why they were so made. It was evident that nothing there was earthly or made by human hands. You are cold, said Illyriel. We can easily warm the car. All the forces of nature are under our command here. So saying, he touched a metal knob on the side of the vault. In a moment a warm breath seemed pouring down upon us from above. I looked up and saw two of the ornaments in the roof glowing at white heat, apparently under powerful electric action. There was no seat in the room, but Illyriel took two downy couches and laid them at our feet, bidding us to repose there, and as he did so, one of his strange companions, reaching up, unhung from one of the ornaments a large ruby vase full of grapes and bread and walking across offered them to maud she shrank at the approach of the strange being and turned to me as if for protection i thought to myself no human power can protect us here if these strange creatures with their wonderful command over the forces of nature chose to injure or kill us i felt how powerless humanity was in such a company Illyriel noted the shrinking and consoled her. Do not refuse our friend as Ariel. You have never had the opportunity before of receiving from the hands of a being of another world the fruits of earth. That vase I brought from the great ocean capital of Mars. So see three worlds, the triad of which earth is centre and largest, are here joined together. The giver is from Venus, the fruits of earth, the vase from Mars. Accept, pray, his refreshment. She took the fruit and bread. He offered it to me, and I accepted it also. End of chapter 29。Part 6 of Illyrial, or A Voyage to Other Worlds, a tale by Vladislav Lachsima. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 30 A Night with Unearthly Friends. Would you like to retire? said Illyriel. You must be tired. I have prepared a couch for you here in this cabin from which I have moved our instruments. He touched a glistening crystal ornament at the side of the room and instantly a sliding panel rose in the wall, disclosing a small cabin where some cushions were laid, covered with rich but quaint ornaments of fine embroidery. The cabin looked comfortable and gorgeously, though eccentrically, fitted. Do let us go back, whispered my wife. It seems dreadful to spend the night with these extraordinary beings. I would rather sleep in the meanest chalet on the slope than in this place. Why should you fear us? said Illyriel. What have we done or said to make you think that we would harm you? We would injure no one. Still, our ways, even our life, is not the same as yours, or under the same conditions. So if in any way you are distressed, say what you wish and we will obey. We retired to the cabin, and were soon asleep on the soft couch. I awoke, however, after the first dose by my wife calling me. I am so faint. I feel suffocating. What can the matter be? I feel the same, I said. The room is hermetically sealed. Ho! Oh, help! I called as I staggered to the door and knocked at it. A soft song answered. I tried the various crystals with which it was embossed. I could not open it, so I knocked more forcibly. It seemed a matter of life and death for really, if, as it appeared, the room was without ventilation, we must shortly be suffocated. A soft song replied. I knocked again. Do let us have some air. There's not ventilation enough. 
again a soft song. I knocked still louder. Then instantly the panel parted. I saw the two unearthly friends of Illyriel standing in the outer domed room, looking towards the cabin. He was not there. They knew, as I was aware, no earthly language. I could only make a sign to my mouth and draw a long breath to imitate breathing. The air in the outer room was purer, but still it was warm and close. However, actual suffocation was not risked there. I tried to make them understand we needed ventilation, but they could not comprehend me. I thought it best for us mortals both to go into the open air and breathe a while. They thought evidently, when I made for the outer entrance, I wished to leave them. However, by gestures I made signs we would return. They touched then the outer panel, and wrapping ourselves up, we passed into the fresh cold mountain air. It was a glorious clear starry night, and the white snow-clad mountains loomed majestically around us. Having both recovered from faintness, we returned to the outer vault chamber. Aronial, it seemed, for that I understood was the being, with the silvery wings and great jewelled star hanging from his neck, had understood my pointing to my mouth as a symbol of need of food, so he had got ready for us a large green vase filled with what looked like some dried fruit. But though really we were both rather hungry, seeing our supper of bread and grapes had been a very light one, we were afraid to eat. It may be poison to us if it is food to them, said Maud. Oh, do not eat it. It is evident there is a danger of their killing us, even without meaning us any harm. That, I said, perhaps was the reason that Illyriel got for us the bread and grapes from the village. Still, the perfume of that food is very great, but I am afraid to eat any of it. It was a strange position to be in, on this earth, in company with beings, though so singular, seemingly good, and certainly benevolent to us, yet fearing to be killed at any time accidentally from the simple reason that our human life was linked by a thread too feeble for them to comprehend i thus realized how impossible it would be for a man to exist even if he could get there in the condition of our earth life on any world but this of ours a lyrial entering soon dispelled our anxiety i motioned my trouble at him at once he quieted us by saying that he had lived long enough on earth to realize the conditions of our earth life and that there would be no danger from our being left alone as he would not depart from us while we remained in his ether car he opened with a burning bar a hole to ventilate our cabin we retired to rest again quieted by his assurance and refreshed by some more provisions which he had procured for us from a chalet not far off End of chapter 30part 6 of a lyrial or a voyage to other worlds a tale by vladislav lachsimer this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 31 explanations next morning we breakfasted in strange company we tasted a morsel of the singular perfumed food which they had supplied and which illyriel said he was sure would be harmless it was most agreeable to the palate our meal was made however of the simple provisions he had got and a little coffee no animal food was offered and i imagine he felt scruples in procuring it at the beginning and end of the meal our hosts with strange but solemn and impressive gestures sang with exquisite sweetness a short hymn after breakfast illyriel said aronial is very anxious to ask you some questions about the earth and i shall act as interpreter may we put them to you and record for our friends to bring home with us the sound of your voices in the phonograph i consented at once and he placed a phonograph of a different form to ours near my mouth for some five hours i then had a strange series of questions put to me which i answered as best i was able 
some of them relating to topics about which i had never thought and which i honestly believe having done a great deal of variorum reading never yet have been discussed on earth others were far simpler but i found a great difficulty in making my replies understood especially in religious questions i found this difficult none of the three evidently could understand how if christianity witnessed so strongly to the doctrine of love christians could so quarrel with each other on religious topics that anyone could be angry on religion none of them evidently could understand it was an insoluble problem they said that if people are in error we should feel pity not anger that truth could not be manifold but one and that passion must tend to encourage error rather than to destroy it then they passed on to another mystery the origin of war they could not see why or wherefore men should try to hurt or still worse to kill one another surely there was enough misery in the world without adding to it this led to politics the political divisions of europe the quarrels of nations and their mutual jealousies the different forms of government even the diversity of languages all seemed to them very mysterious on every matter they not only asked me what the case on earth was but why things were as they were as i like most people had taken things much as i found them the causes of our social phenomena were very puzzling in not a few matters then pressed hard i had to reply that all this must be the result of sin and of man's fall and if men were better things could not be in such a state i must own it was painful to give these strangers so unfavourable an idea of humanity and of our earth but there was no help for it then we turned to other topics to the mysteries of nature to the laws of death and pain and disease here new difficulties arose i had again to plead the fall and man's sin it seems they knew of no pain only under certain unfavourable circumstances for example on saturn or amid the burning regions of jupiter they had felt a certain difficulty of existence pain localized pain they had never felt i found however they were not sure that they would under all circumstances be secured from death or rather would have to seek a new form of corporeal existence as ariel put it but they always had evaded this by precautions and by their intense and renewable vitality. End of chapter 31。Part 6 of A Lyrial or A Voyage to Other Worlds, a tale by Vladislav Lachsima. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 32 Adieu at length i was physically wearied by the conversation which required all my concentrated faculties to follow i felt that if my object was to defend the state of society in our world i had a bad cause maud tried to help me here and there with bright woman's wit and to explain things i could not make clear our weariness was noticed by our hosts who got us a refreshing midday meal and as ariel offered us with it in an emerald goblet a strange but most exquisite liquor which entirely recovered us both and the invigorating effects of which we felt for weeks after then we renewed our conversation and so talked on till late in the afternoon when i said that we must go if we would reach the inn before sunset they made no objections but said in an hour they meant to depart from earth our farewell was as strange as our meeting and i felt a certain regret i know not how to express it at parting with those who appeared so good and happy and who had tried to be so kind to us isariel and aroniel both accompanied us to the door and giving each of us a small ring of crystal as a keepsake raised a sweet song of blessing and each according to their use as it seemed touched us on the forehead a solemn thrill passed through me then we turned half unwillingly to descend the mountain a leading the way 
we soon reached a beaten path and then Illyrial also bade us farewell god bless you both and may we meet again in a happier world so saying he parted from us remounting the declivity a few minutes after i heard a sudden explosion as it seemed in the mountain and felt a rushing gust of wind they are gone said maud i am glad now i have seen them it was like a glimpse of heaven end of part six end of chapter thirty two end of a lyrial or a voyage to other worlds a tale by vladislav lachsima this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please go to librivox dot org recording by nigel carrington buckinghamshire england twenty eighteen